Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. I'm really excited for our guest today. We're going to learn a lot about a lot of different things, but I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. It's always great to see the professor, the brain, the flight school Sherpa on another podcast. I guess, yeah. So today's guest is Shane Melanson. He's a real estate developer, real estate investor, a cash flow specialist. Not only that, I think his most important job is dad and husband. Shane Melanson, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. So Shane, let's just rewind the tape and tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I grew up in a logging town, Whitecourt, Alberta, which is just north of Edmonton. And both my parents were teachers. So kind of at a young age, I, uh, I noticed a lot of my friends whose parents were entrepreneurial. Um, I didn't really understand what they did, but they generally went on nice vacations, had all the toys. And I never worried about money, but there was always a little bit of stress, if you will. And so I was always looking for different ways to, you know, acquire more, uh, you know, really live a, a life that I was seeing others. And I got into investing in when I was 19. Uh, it was a deal that was brought to me from a good friend. And <clears throat> long story short, my dad remortgaged his house, $100,000. Uh, I put everything that I had saved up that year building roads and put it into a deal and lost it. And so that was kind of the first foyer into investing. And what it really taught me was the importance of understanding risk, due diligence, asking questions, getting into things that you don't understand. I think Warren Buffett talks about risk is in, you know, investing in what you don't, what do you, what you don't understand, what you don't know. And so that was really kind of a, a lesson for me. And for the next five years, all I did was work and save my money. I didn't invest. I, I was fearful. I didn't even really trust the banks. I had it in a security deposit uh, until a good friend of mine that I was living in his basement suite uh, was showing me that he was investing in real estate and he worked nights at the bar and kind of three or four hours a day to kind of manage his, his real estate assets. And that was really what kind of triggered me to at least open my mind that maybe it was possible to do something more and have my money work for me versus me having to always work for my money. And so that was really kind of what, what got me into real estate investing, but that was single family. And since then I've, you know, moved on to commercial and developments and whatnot. So we can, we can jump off wherever you want. Sure. Sure. Scott, Todd, your thoughts. I mean, so, you know, I think that a lot of people, they, they think of real estate and the one thing that they think about is in fact, like single family, right? Like that's, that's the thing that people think about yeah. why, I mean, maybe it's cause we live in it. I mean, maybe cause our entire life revolves around single family, but you know, when, when you're looking at like that single family, it's, uh, everybody knows it's really competitive. How did like, how did you make the jump to something else or what prompted you to make the jump to from, from something else? And like, do you wish you wouldn't have just gone single family first and you would have gone to something else first? Um, so, so a couple of questions in there. Number one, I guess I, I didn't even really understand commercial real estate. Uh, I was working at uh, the city of Calgary and I was noticing uh, sales of the same property that were transacting because I was, when I was an appraiser, I would see one property would sell. And then within the same year, it would sell again at a much higher price. So I started to see how fixing and flipping and then potentially doing long-term rentals was a way to, to invest and make money. During that time, I had a good friend who was at Sun Life and he asked me if I was interested in becoming a commercial lender, a broker. And I, I, I didn't really understand what that was, but I went to the interview. They liked me, brought me in. And that was my introduction into the world of commercial real estate. And, but it was on the lending side. And so every once in a while, we would have clients that weren't your pension funds or publicly traded companies. They'd be syndicators, right? Two guys would come in, they would sit down. And, and I was like wondering how they're buying a five or 10 or $15 million property. 
And I would ask them and they would say, well, you know, we're, we're putting in say 10 or 15% of the money. The balance of it is coming from our investors, right? They didn't really go deeper than that, but I could see that, you know, if, if to really build wealth and cash flow that could replace a six or six figure income, if you will, commercial real estate, apartments, industrial, retail, um, this is something that I really wanted to get into. And in 2008, um, I met my wife, uh, maybe it was 2007, I should probably know this, but uh, anyways, uh, her father was a big developer here in Calgary. Uh, they've been around for about 95, 96 years. And he brought me into the world of commercial real estate, showed me how to raise capital, how to find the right deals, and so for the, you know, I, I quit my job at Sun Life and I went full time into finding deals in the US and across Canada. And so that was like, I was very fortunate, right? Because there's not a lot of people that go from fixing and flipping $180,000 homes to buying, you know, eight figure properties, if you will, right? So I was, I, would, I, I realized that that was a unique situation. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question in terms of? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so Shane, Making that leap had to be very difficult. Just the due diligence alone is, is I mean, you could have brain damage on, on some of the stuff compared to a single family home. Sure. So, you know, when you or just got into it, what were some of the, the challenges that you faced as far as just analyzing and finding a good deal? I think the the biggest thing for me, the biggest learning lesson was what a good deal was from a bad deal. And every Friday, Andy, my father-in-law, the two of us would sit down and he'd say, bring me the deals. And then he would just pepper me with questions. And I mean, it could be who's the neighbor, what's the zoning, who owned it, when, when was it bought, what, would, you know, what did it transact at? Just this whole list of questions. And if I'm bringing 10 or 15 deals a week to show him, you can just imagine like th there was no way we were going to go into that kind of depth. But, but what it did is it started to teach me the type of questions and the type of things that he was looking for. And if I was to kind of summarize it, it was like, there was certain non-negotiables, right. In terms of, you know, we don't want to pay more than what we could replace it for. So then I had to start understanding what land values are. I think that's, that's, you know, near and dear to your guys's audience. Uh, what are construction costs? Uh, how long does it take? What are the constraints on the land? Can you upzone it? Um, these were all things that I just started to learn over time. And, and because I was immersed in it, you know, I, I, I mean, there was never like a pivotal day or time or moment or whatnot. But as you start to do more and more deals, you realize how important it is to make sure that you only invest in properties that have, for me anyways, the value add or upside. Because as a syndicator, that's really how I make my money. I make a little bit on the front end, but I would say 80 to 90% of it is on the back end. And I've worked four or five years for free because, um, you know, deals took longer than, than they should have. Uh, we underestimated some of the expenses. Uh, as you know, land is sometimes difficult to finance. Uh, we did an 1,153 acre uh, land lease community or mobile home community. And because it was a development, the cash was never, it was never sufficient to get conventional financing. So we always used mezzanine or self-financing and it worked well for the investors, but it didn't work really well for the general partners. Um, but those are, you know, just kind of lessons that you learn as, as you do deals. Sure. Sure. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? You know, what, one of the things I think that I, I, I picked up on what Shane said, and I, I think it's one of the things that I think a lot of people miss is the immersion, right? You know, I think that anytime you can immerse yourself into learning something, you know, it, it becomes, in a way, it, it becomes all encompassing. Yeah. And, and may, maybe you want to say, like, you know, everything else is, a, you're oblivious to everything else, but this is the thing I'm going to focus on. But when you do that, what happens is you get a greater understanding of how things are operating. And, you know, one of the cool things for me to, have been able to see in my lifetime, Marcus, is, is I've been able to see like CEOs come into a big company and literally it looks like they hit the ground running from day one, even though they didn't work in that business or even that industry. And I think that the one thing that they do successfully is they immerse themselves in the business, right? Like they go in there and they, they might spend 
12, 14, 16 hours a day learning the business and the moving components of it. And they, they get that visualization of it. And I think that like, even for what Shane was saying, like he would, he would gather up these deals and he was immersed in it, right? Like he was living this thing. It, beca- it, it almost, I, I want to bet you, it became kind of consuming in his life, but that's the only way that you can kind of get the ground and hit the ground running. And then you become an expert at it. But Shane, like, am I wrong in that piece? And then like, if, if you're immersed in it, like you kind of have to force yourself to turn a blind eye to all these other shiny objects, objects that are out there in real estate. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I would say that first there was, there was the definite immersion and commitment, right? Like there was no, essentially when, when I left my, my great job at, at Sun Life, um, I didn't have a safety net, right? But I was confident enough that we were going to do a deal. Now it didn't, it, it took some time. I want to say it was at least 12 months before we found a property that actually made sense. But once that, once that happened, the next deal came six months later and then the next deal. And so number one, yes, absolutely like a hundred percent commitment into commercial real estate. But what I quickly realized was I had to start narrowing the focus because we were looking at properties in Texas, in, across Canada, in Arizona, and, and you can just imagine just in, in Houston, for example, with 6 million people, I mean, are you looking at retail, industrial, office, multifamily? And so then it was like, okay, let's just focus on multi and then let's just focus on value add and let's focus on these three sub markets. And so it just, but it, but it was an iterative process and I didn't have anybody that said, Shane, you need to focus, right? It was find good deals and show them to me. And, and so it was really, you know, um, uh, just trial and error, if you will. But I think having a bit of a roadmap and an understanding of where it is that you want to get to uh, is important. And um, I think sometimes mentors kind of know that, but they don't necessarily articulate that. And, and it wasn't like I was paying, right? I mean, in, in fact, I was, I was paying to, <laughs> with, with, my, uh, uh, with my time, if you will, to work with him. Um, yeah, sweat, sweat equity. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't talk about it, but most people starve their first year in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you don't have savings or you're not, you don't have something else going um, that first year is all learning curve. It's very, very difficult. You know, I I just want to touch on that uh, Mark, because I think that that is uh, one of the mistakes I see new real estate investors doing is they maybe get one deal or they think, okay, I've got this. Now I can quit my, my great paying job. And, and, I, and I, I caution against that because markets are cyclical and, you know, just having one property, one asset, one stream of cash flow, uh, it, it, it can be quite risky to, to bank on that property performing because if, if you've been in this game long enough, you know that there's going to be times where rents go down, vacancies go up and, uh, you know, ha- having multiple streams of revenue is, is just, I, I think it's just so important. So, so that being said, are you more opportunistic as far as when you're looking at deals or right now, are you just completely focused on value add? So I would say from 2015 to 2019, I was pretty opportunistic. And the reason for that is the markets were hot and it was challenging to find um, really good value add opportunities. So I did a couple of ground up developments. One, we did three industrial buildings. Uh, both were off market deals. The second was a retail development and, and it's still performing well, in spite of the fact that, you know, the, the day and age that we're in right now, unfortunately our tenants are, you know, gas stations and, and, uh, liquor stores and mobile, you know, lube shops and whatnot. But, um, uh, yeah, I would say that they were very opportunistic today. I'm far more, um, diligent and focused on the locations and the asset classes that I'm, I'm working on. And I think just, given what's happened in the past 12 months uh, with, with COVID and whatnot, I think it's, it's really opened my eyes to the new types of risk and the type of assets that I can see a future for. So what are those assets you see a future for? So I like uh, where like industrial, uh, I like multi-bay, small multi-bay warehouses, and I like multifamily. Those are the two that I'm most comfortable with. Um, 
I suppose you could, you know, there's still an argument for some retail, but I'm just, I'm, I'm more and more nervous about that just with, you know, the, the, you know, Amazon effect uh, with COVID uh, the type of tenants that are, that are going to be around in the next 10 or 15 years. I, I, I just don't have a clear uh, path or, or site for that. So I'm, I'm kind of moving away from that asset class. Scott Todd. You said multi-day industrial warehouse. What is that? M Multi-bay. So, so oh, think multi -bay. of, yeah. Okay. So think of like, you know, the, the buildings that we built were anywhere from 10 to 15,000 square feet. They're two to 3000 square foot uh, bays and they appeal to a broad range of tenants. And so that was really, you know, that, that, that's an asset class that I, I believe is going to be around. It's, it's something that I understand. Uh, when I was a broker, I did a lot of leasing and sales in that. So it, it's just, you know, to your point of the immersion, when you do it for long enough, you start to have a sensitivity on what tenants needs are. And then it's really just focusing on what the needs are and, and where there's what I call like a supply uh, demand gap. And so if there's more demand, then I'll enter those markets, whether it's from a development or value add per, um, play. All right. Interesting. Interesting. So what's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your expertise of commercial real estate? Um, I think some of the worst advice that I see are, uh, number one, the amount of leverage that you can get doesn't necessarily mean that you should get it. And, and I see a lot of investors, especially in an up market, you know, stacking on a ton of debt, whether it's you know, like, like when you look at their capital stack, they're coming in with a very low amount of equity. And if any, if there's any hiccups in that deal, it takes too long, there's cost overruns, those guys just get squeezed out. And I've seen it time and time again. Um, I would say that that's probably one of the, the biggest mistakes I see. Uh, another is buying on price versus like really looking at the deal holistically, right? I mean, there are I mean, I want to say in the past probably three or four years, I would have clients sending me deals saying, look at this property, it's 50 grand a door, or it's, you know, I can pick it up for a hundred bucks a foot. And I'm looking at the market and I'm looking at the location and I'm saying, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to own that because like in my mind, that's dumb money, right? Dumb money, meaning you don't know what you're doing. You're taking out someone else's problem and now you're stuck with it. And as a broker, I saw that so often where you would have, Someone buying at the peak of the cycle, and then they get jammed with a deal that, you know, they end up feeding 10, 15, 20,000 a month. They can't sell it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very sad, but it, it happens more often than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Todd, any, any thoughts? I mean, you know, I, I think that's very, I mean, like that is a very tempting thing to do, right? Like, oh my gosh, look at this, uh, look at this pick, fill in the blank, you know, like, Look, look at the, I, I fall guilty to it too. Oh my gosh. Look at this, uh, multifamily house for $150,000. Oh my gosh. It's got two units. I, I, I mean, and then I have to look at it and go, geez, that looks like a fine scene on the inside of it. Right. Like you got to reel yourself out. It's not always about price. I think what it comes back down to obviously is yield and do the numbers work because, you know, you look at somebody like, um, Grant Cardone, for example, the guys buying, you know, class A, B properties, you know, spending buku bucks with like a lower cap rate, but it's working for the the structure that he has. And so, you know, I think that you got to find your little niche and move forward with it. Yeah. And, and, and just, just on that, I mean, I, I've made some of these mistakes myself, like in 2013, I bought an apartment building, the market was going up. It was an older property close to a school, but it was still in a bit of a C location. And had I been, um, had I really thought about the exit, I think that's probably one other uh, mistake is you get into a property, but you don't have a clear exit. Who's the buyer? What, what, what is that buyer looking for? And, um, and I missed it, right? We added the value, we increased it, we had unsolicited offers, and then I kept it past its, its, uh, its real peak sale date and we still own it. It's still performing, but it's, um, you know, it's a lot more work these days, you know, owning a property that's, uh, you know, a C-class building. So I, I think just having a real clear exit is, is just um, another important consideration. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Shane, your mentorship has been fantastic, this podcast, but we're now at the point in the podcast where we're going to ask you for one more nugget of wisdom, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives, a book, a resource, something, you know, that you would recommend. What do you got? Uh, well, I think uh, one book that I really enjoyed is by Keith Cunningham. And uh, what's it called? Keys to the Vault. Now, Keys Keith Cunningham, vault. yeah, Keith Cunningham is a gentleman that uh, has, has been, at least by some uh, experts out there, that he's the real rich dad, poor dad behind Robert Kiyosaki. And I think that if you read some of his books, uh, he's just, he's got a lot of wisdom as it relates to risk, understanding deals, uh, deal structures, whether it's raising capital, investing. So I would say, um, you know, even, even over my, my own book, I think that that's probably the, the best resource that I could point your uh, uh, audience to. All right, keys to the vault. Lessons from the pros on raising money and igniting your, uh, your business. Yeah, he's Thanks got a couple of books that that are out, but um, I think Keys to the Vault is is the one that I I you know like I said I keep it on my my uh, shelf behind me and it's a it's a reminder and a, de- a book that I read you know. All right, fantastic. Yeah. So Scott Todd, before we get to your tip of the week, I just want to give out a shout out to our sponsor, Flight School. Learn how the next sixteen weeks of your life can literally be transformed. Start building up your passive income machine, but do it in real time. This is not a do it yourself. This is, I don't know, why not go up the mountain of land investing with someone who's done it literally thousands of times over the next 16 weeks, execute in real time with Scott Todd as your Sherpa going up that mountain quickly, safely, efficiently. And we guarantee that the tuition investment that you make in flight school, you're going to make it back 180 days or less guaranteed. So schedule a call with uh, the Zen Master or the Nightcap OG, Scott Bossman, Mike Zeno, thelandgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training, and find out if this niche is right for you. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark. Uh, my tip of the week is also a book. It's a book on uh, obviously Amazon, and it's called Am I Being Too Subtle? by a guy named Sam Zell, little guy named Sam Zell, little guy in real estate. And, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting story. Uh, you, you know, the subtitle there is straight talk from a business rebel. I, I listened to it. I, I listened to the audio version of it. I liked it, right? Like I like the guy's personality and uh, check it out. Yeah, I, I liked it. I, I listened to him. He's, he's really, you know, um, he starts with his values first. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, he, he licks his deals, but like, he's a billionaire. His, his voice is kind of funny. He's got yeah, his family voice and um, you know, he's talking about his family and all this, but uh, that's a great, a great recommendation. And yeah. of course, if we're still talking about books, if you go to my tip of the week, which is shanemelanson.com, there's a book on there. So check out Shane's book, Club Syndication, How the Wealthy Invest Your Money Discover how to raise capital, invest in commercial real estate. Claim your copy today. There you go. So check out, I have a, a link to it because no one can spell Melanson. ShaneMelanson.com. Shane, are we good? That's good. I appreciate it, guys. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Well, I want to thank the listeners and remind them the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality guests like a Shane Melanson from ShaneMelanson.com is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you the course, how to double your money, 30 days or less. The wholetailing course, usually 97 bucks for free. So please do that. Um, It really helps. And then, you know, Scott and I just like to see your reviews. Like, you know, sometimes it's good for our fragile little egos. So please do that. Subscribe, rate, review. All right. You ready to do this? One, two, three, let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Okay, not bad. I think Shane kind of gave that look like these crazy Americans. <laughs> it's like, I'm so glad I'm Canada. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks guys.